Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Shane Mahoney. The reason I have come across the North American continent this evening, all the way across from the island of Newfoundland to the furthest extreme western region of this enormous land, is to thank you. I have been in the business of fighting for wildlife and trying to explain to the citizenries of the world why the sustainable use traditions of hunting and angling have mattered, why they continue to matter, and why they don't just matter to us personally, but they matter because they have extraordinary impact on the future of the natural world. I would not have spent my entire life to this point in time, nor would I give the remainder of the rest of my life to this mission if, it, if I did not believe that what you do and what generations like you before you have done to contribute to the conservation of the wild others that share this planet with us. If I did not believe that you had made a singular contribution to keeping wild nature with us, I would not be here. I have tried to explain to a lot of American audiences why it is that I admire this country. I am not an American citizen, but I have come to this country many times over many years. I have met many friends and colleagues, and I have read your history more than most of you have. I find your fascinating history something that I learn a great deal from. And as many close friends in the United States know, I study your politics extremely closely whenever I'm bored. <laughs> whenever I want relief, I read about the politics of the nation. But you know, there is a deep connection between this world of conservation and this world of hunting and the building of a nation. And those who have any understanding of American history realize this and know that we today continue to live one of the great traditions that played such a significant role in creating this great and influential nation. It was not by accident that the United States of America was able to defeat the largest and most able army and navy in the world for its time. It was because of the capacities of the people who lived in this country and the beliefs that the people of this country had, both in themselves and in the principles that eventually would be identified as America. And it was also because this nation had already given birth to a cadre of people who were capable on the land who were not afraid of the frontier and who were able, when called upon, to defend family, nation, and home. Every nation relies on its citizens, ladies and gentlemen, 
not upon its government. I'm sure there's a great many people who would agree with that. And it has been the citizens of the United States of America who have made this country great. America has given a great deal to the world. Some people find it fashionable to suggest that times are tough in America and maybe the country is on its way down. I spend a lot of time doing international travel. I have a lot of colleagues and friends in other parts of the world and I get into some great discussions with people from Europe and Asia about where the future of the world lies and where the future of America lies. It's very interesting to me that they will say something like, oh, the American economy is doing very poorly, you know. And I say, yes, but it's as big as the next two biggest combined. Like a lot of us would like to be doing that badly. <laughs> uh, they say, well, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, they don't have a, as big an army as they used to have, you know. I said, no, but they own space. And they have technologies associated with that that the rest of the world will take decades to catch up to. Well, you know, they're not offering up as many innovations as they used to, you know, not as smart as they used to be, those Americans. Well, I say, who gave us the internet? Who gave us the private uh, personal computer? Who gave us the personal phone? That's all happened fairly recently. Ben Franklin had nothing to do with that, I tell you. <laughs> this is a new crop of American ingenuity that has given this to the world. No. You have and you continue to give a great deal to the world, including the freedoms that many of us in other countries rely on. Because without you and the two great wars, the rest of us will be living very different lives right now. Some of us, from other parts of the world, indeed many of us from other parts of the world, do not forget this. And so, some of us travel long distances to say thank you. Of course, this evening we are gathered about something specific, aren't we? Another example of what American people do. They come together and form organizations and give of their time and their money to make the world a better place. As we sit here this evening, we can be absolutely certain that scattered across this great country there are many such meetings taking place, all for various reasons. Some are dedicated to other aspects of progress besides conservation and hunting. But nevertheless, the meetings are taking place. And they're ordinary people. They're not all the elites of the United States of America. It's average people coming together to do things in a common way, to build piece by piece a better organization, a better community, a better nation, a better world. In this particular room tonight, I have a surprise for you. And the surprise for you is to let you know that you stand on the shoulders of giants and that what you do here this very evening will be one part, one additional segment in a long thread that goes back over a hundred years to doing one of the greatest things that the United States of America has ever done, which is to rescue from certain oblivion some of the most magnificent wild creatures that this planet has ever seen. 
Now, it is hard for many people in America today to believe what I'm about to say, so I am going to rely on all of you to take what I have to say this evening and bring it back to every single person you know. Bore them to death if necessary. Lock them in a room. <laughs> Capture them in an elevator. Speak to them even if they're in a stall in a bathroom so they can't simply escape. <laughs> find ingenious ways to communicate this story that I'm about to tell you. If your country had had an Endangered Species Act in 1900 or 1910, immediately listed upon that act would have been elk, white-tailed deer, wild turkey, pronghorn antelope, mule deer, Canada geese, wood duck, beaver, black bear, and a host of other species. Because at that time, every single one of those species had declined to such an extent that the Boone and Crockett Club organized a display in New York City of heads and horns of those very species I just mentioned, with the caption above it reading, Come and see America's vanishing wildlife. In the full and honest belief that you your generation, let alone the young people I see in this audience, you would never see them in the wild. Now, not one in a thousand, not one in ten thousand, not one in one hundred thousand of your citizens know that's true. And thus, that's why you have to capture them and in the way I've suggested. Because then what America did is what America always does. A handful of people said, we will not let this happen. We're simply going to stop it. And stopping it meant stopping enormous the important and influential corporations and businesses and individuals and communities and cities and government officials and all kinds of others who were making fortunes feeding dead wildlife to markets in the United States of America. Some of them were the same corporations that were fixing your sugar prices and your flour prices for profit. But a group of people stood up the most famous of which was Theodore Roosevelt, but believe me, there were many others, who said, we're going to stop all this, and we are going to explain to the American people just how important our natural resources are. As a matter of fact, as president, I'm going to tell them that conservation of natural resources, including wildlife, is the most important thing for this country to do. As a quick aside, you may ask yourself, why you cannot find the word conservation anywhere in the debates going on for the White House today. But that's just an aside. I don't want you to take that too seriously or get depressed over it. But just notice it. And they said we will not lose them. Now, a lot of times when we see the problems we have today and what we have to do to keep wildlife and hunting with us, we say our problems are enormous. Our challenges are so great. We have terrible things out there, like social media. I mean, I'm beginning to feel it's kind of like a, a great monster. It's going to eat us all one of these days. It's blamed for so much. But think what they had. No state agencies, no organizations like the one sitting here in this room this evening, no game laws, 
no enforcement ranks. Wildlife science had not even been invented. There were no university programs teaching people how to manage wildlife. There were no federal agencies looking after this problem. There were no tax-based funding mechanisms. There were no permits to buy and monies to be raised. But out of passion and commitment and blind American determination, they said, we will not lose them. And today, we sit in this room because of them and because since that time men and women just like the men and women in this room refused to have a reality without wildlife exist in your country and because those far-sighted people took the hunting of wildlife and knew that if they gave it to the citizens of this country and incentivized them to do the right thing for wildlife that the hunting community in this country, along with others who helped, would not only rescue wildlife, but would protect it, work for it, sustain it, and be the great champions for keeping it with America forever. You are remembered for a great deal, but I can assure you that this idea of conservation that you gave and cultured and improved and strengthened will in this 21st century be seen as the greatest and most important idea of all. We are on our way, ladies and gentlemen, whether we want to believe it or not, to eight billion of us and then to nine. And the entire world and the security that we face, all of it will be determined by how we manage to safeguard and share the natural resources of the world. And if we can find examples of nations that have taken their natural resources and their wildlife and rescued them from the brink of extinction and brought them to the point where we have turkeys in our driveways, white-tailed deer on the bumpers of our cars far too frequently, and Canada geese insulting us every six minutes on our lawns and golf courses, then I guess we'll say we have a chance. Some people have worked very hard to push this idea of hunting and angling to the margins of society. Well, I'm here to tell everyone who wishes to see an end to this that this tradition is not going away. We have, between those of us who hunt and those of us who fish as well, between 35 and 40 million citizens who continue to harvest from the natural world of Canada and the United States an amount of wild food that is almost unbelievable. We are, in fact, one of the largest environmentally friendly food production systems in the world. Now, just imagine your friend that you have trapped in the stall of the bathroom and you start telling them these stories, right? You can get an idea of where this will end up. But it is true. Millions upon millions upon millions of wild creatures are harvested legally every year, and yet the populations are managed in such a way that they are sustainable for this generation and for those to come. This. This is what the world seeks. This is what nations yearn for. So no, we are not here in some simple game. We are here in something that happens to involve expenditures of maybe $38 billion a year and 
is responsible for three quarters of a million or a million jobs in this country, that provides great, chunky, fat, rounded tax benefits to governments at every level in this nation that are then spent on services for people. Where did this notion come from that this is some kind of sideshow? Who allowed this to become part of the common discussions of America? Can you imagine if we had 35 to 40 million people doing anything else? Anything else? But that's how many of us do this thing. Old, young, man, woman, grandfather, grandchild, rich, poor, democratic, legal, sustainable. What's the problem with this story? Nothing. Hunting has done so much for all of us, but it has done a great deal for our countries as well. It has created a legendary force of people that through every election cycle in this country and in Canada, through every issue that arises with respect to land and development and the fate of wildlife, a legendary force of people who speak out who sends people to the offices of the political elites to argue on behalf of wildlife, who volunteer in enormous numbers to do everything from putting in water holes and guzzlers for bighorn sheep in the desert to repairing or tearing down fences as is necessary, to providing money, to buying things at exorbitant rates, and of course you all realize you're here to be fleeced this evening. I mean, that's the, just, so, just so you know, so all clear about that. And volunteer to do this happily, pass that tradition on to their children, their grandchildren, care about the environment, share meat, share meat. You know, none of you would go to the grocery store and buy a prime rib roast and go up to your neighbor's door and knock on the door and say, here, Jack, I bought your prime rib. <laughs> because you know that Jack would look at you and he'd say, my friend, you've lost your mind and I do not wish this. <laughs> but shoot your elk. Shoot your wild turkey. Huh? Shoot your deer. Catch your brook trout or your salmon. You haven't even got the fillet knife going along before you're thinking about which piece is going to whom. And then you give a third of it away, half of it away. And when you knock on the door and you give them that fillet of salmon, or a fillet of elk, instead of saying, go away, you're mad, they open the door and haul you in and give you a great big hug and say, oh my God, that's the best thing I ever had in my life. <laughs> and you know what? I'm going to cook that at a special time. The children are coming over next weekend or my grandmother's birthday is next week. It can't even just be cooked normally, that wild meat. It has to be done for something special. This is going on by 35 to 40 million people in our societies every single day of the year. And I want to ask you something. What is wrong with that? Right. <laughs> nothing. That's exactly what's wrong with that. Absolutely nothing. 
So we build this legendary force of activists for wildlife. We pay for the right to go out and harvest the wildlife that we ourselves have not alone, I stress this, others fight for it too, not just hunters. But we pay an enormous part of the freight to keep wildlife with us. Then we pay for a permit to go out and harvest that animal. And then when we harvest that animal, we give most of it away. We do it in an environmentally friendly way, mostly on Shanks Mare, or on the back of a horse, or in a small boat that we navigate waterways with, or whatever. We leave the land essentially as it was. We take from it incredible spiritual experience, knowledge of the natural world. When did that ever become unimportant? When did we finally decide that knowledge of the natural world is not important? That it's more important to know the circuitry in a microphone? Or it's more important to know how to, I don't know, build a drone? When did it happen that that kind of knowledge was placed up here and the knowledge of the natural world, the very thing we depend upon, the very thing that gives us inspiration, the very thing that makes us full and whole, that that knowledge is less important. This is insane. This is insane. When I am hungry, I'd like to know about the natural world. And when I am cold, I would like to know about the natural world. And when I am threatened, I would like to know about the natural world. I only need a microphone in pretty civilized circumstances. No offense to those of you who work in the communications business. <laughs> You gotta say that when you're up here because you know they could flip a switch and then you know, <clears throat> you'd be talking to yourself and you know that's, that's, that's it's not good. So and uh, they will get some game meat next year, so that will keep them. <laughs> Conservation is no accident, ladies and gentlemen, and the building of a nation is no accident either. Preserving our traditions is something that falls to us. There is no government anywhere. That's not a wishful thought, by the way. It's just, uh, I, I'm not finished. There is no government anywhere <clears throat> that we can rely on to do this for us. Any more than we should rely on a government to teach us how to create good, caring people from the little, small human beings that we raise in our homes and families. Conservation and the building of a nation are both driven by the commitments that individuals have to it. And it is only by the efforts and abilities, no matter how modest or how great, of every individual coming together, that we have a chance to succeed. And when sometimes you feel that there is too much criticism, or you feel that too much has been marshaled against us, remember what we achieved a hundred and more years ago Remember that we have been achieving for now well over a century. And remember that here in this room this evening, you stand or sit as testimony to the fact that this will live on. You must remind yourself what you stand against. I have lived with nature more than, I am sure, the vast majority of you. 
I have been with wild creatures to the point where I knew every sound they made and every smell that came from them. I lay in the ground that they had laid upon because it was still warm so that I would be warm. I have been inside the dens of bears while they slept. And those experiences taught me that every single one of those creatures <clears throat> is extraordinarily special. But I also know that man is a part of nature and that it is incredibly unnatural to assume that we would stand outside of the great circle of life and death. The difference for us is that we must think about how we do it and do it in the best possible way that we can. We must bring to what we do the greatest of all possible respect for the animals that we take we must never frivolously engage in the death of a single one. And we must come to understand at the end of an animal's death that we did not so much as succeed as that somehow something favored us and as a result we received a gift. We have to realize that there is much we now have to change. We are now at a time when we have to show the absolute best in ourselves. We are at a time where we must lead, follow or become completely irrelevant. And I am extraordinarily hopeful because I know the history of this movement and I know what we have achieved already. Some days I get an awful lot of email from hunters who say to me, surely it is over, what are we going to do about this or what are we going to do about that? And I'll tell you that every day in fighting for something that you believe in is a leap of faith. And I will tell you that I have seen leaps of faith. I worked on an offshore island, for me, lots of offshore islands for many years, and studied seabirds. One of the birds I studied was a tall, dark bird of about this height that nests on very narrow ledges of land, lays a single egg which is very pointed so when it is touched, it spins instead of rolling off cliffs that would drop it to eight to 10,000 feet into the water and cliffs below. We hunt them and eat them and have done so since we've been on the island of Newfoundland, which is about 500 years. That's a lot of those birds. The birds are fascinating because the little chick is raised, hatched out of the egg, and he cowers and stays on his one small little piece of land and he doesn't wander very far because if he wanders to the left, he gets pecked by another bird. And if he wanders to the right, he gets pecked by another bird. Did you ever feel like that in your life? <laughs> I have at times. But anyway, I, I digress. So the little bird lives in this one little patch of ledge. And for about four weeks, he stays there being fed by his mother and father. I'm not afraid to use those terms, as you will notice, calling animals mothers and fathers. Um, that doesn't really cause my innards to get all tightened up. I, I'm quite comfortable calling them mothers and fathers. And they're fed each time with one fish that is given to the little tur, and he sits in the sunshine or the fog with this fish in his mouth protruding, and he slowly digests this fish and then falls asleep and waits for the next one to come to him. He has a perfect existence for his first four weeks because everything is looked after. You know, the kind of thing we work for all our lives, so you can retire and have a, have a life like that. You know how it never works out? Well, for these little chicks, it works out for them for the first four weeks. But then, into four weeks, late in the evening, 
something changes on this island of millions of birds soaring around me, on these cliff edges, screaming and preening and bringing back fish, all of a sudden a new level of energy comes. These little birds are there, they cannot fly. They're mostly down, filled still, no real feathers, great big set of black feet, and suddenly down in the water below, five, six, eight, or ten thousand feet below, the parent birds begin to swim back and forth. And as they swim back and forth, they open their mouths and make a great growl. Well, like anything you've ever heard a bird do, it's a growl. And their yellow mouths are visible all the way down. And those little chicks, which have never been off that one square piece of rock in their entire lives, even when I would come down on ropes to measure them, they would never dare go beyond and fall over. They begin to go to the edge and peek over. They run back, they go to the edge again, and they peek over. And then finally, as the parents are down below screaming mad, these little chicks jump. They jump out into that completely different world of air now they are floating with their big feet out before them, and you understand why now they have those great big feet. And they beat their little short wings that have no feathers yet, so fast they're like hummingbirds, and they eventually manage to land down in the rocks and sea, and the sea shoots them sometimes 50, 60, 80, 100 feet up the cliff face, and then back down again, but eventually you see them pop up like little corks, and one chick will go to sea with one adult bird. Those chicks will stay at sea for five years before they ever touch land again. And then they'll come back to that island. If they stayed in the circumstances they were in, no matter how comfortable they were, they had no future. They had to make a leap of faith into a completely new world in order to survive and to flourish. We are called upon in the hunting movement, ladies and gentlemen, now to do some great things to show the very best of ourselves and to make what those little birds make in every such circumstance, which is a great leap of faith. I know you will, and I know wildlife will be the better off for it, and I thank you. Have a great day. Ladies and gentlemen, Shane Mahoney.